Hello and welcome everyone. Today's presenter is Mr. Phil Lockwood. You may remember watching National Geographic years ago and seeing beautiful scenery when they were doing some research in the northern rainforest of the Congo. Mr. Lockwood is the one responsible for that camera platform that we know today as the AirCam. Phil Lockwood is going to talk to you today about the care and maintenance of both using a Rotax engine and maintaining one. He's an expert in this field, and in fact, his company has the largest repair facility for Rotax engines in the whole United States. Please welcome Mr. Phil Lockwood. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you. How's everyone doing today? I hope you're enjoying the show. Uh, as Kathleen mentioned, we're going to give you some very good tips and pointers on how to maintain, set up, and operate your Rotax 9 Series engine. <coughs> One of the first things that uh, I want to talk about today is getting your engine uh, ready for storage and, and pulling it back out of storage after it hasn't been run for an extended period of time. Uh, <coughs> One of the things that uh, we see most often affecting the engine is gasoline going bad. And a lot of our op operators use auto gas, which does have a limited storage life. This is the most critical aspect of, stor of storing the aircraft engine, the Rotax, and uh, getting it back in, into service. If you're using auto gas, we recommend you use a fuel stabilizer. Uh, Pennzoil makes one, um, as shown here on the screen. It's a, also a fuel system stabilizer. And there's another one uh, that's pretty well known called Stabil. Now, these are remarkable products. And I have seen auto gas stored for up to a year uh, without any ill effects when using one of those products. However, if you store auto gas without any stabilizer in it, it will deteriorate fairly rapidly in small quantities. If you have a large quantity, a 500-gallon tank, it might last a year. If it's only a five-gallon tank, it might only last a few months before you start seeing deterioration. And if it's only the fuel in your carburetor bowl, um, that can deteriorate more rapidly, and it affects the main jet and the idle jets on the bottom of the carburetor. <coughs> now, while we're talking about auto gas, which is the preferred fuel for the Rotax engine, let's just talk about octane requirements quickly. The 912S, which is the most popular engine in the light sport market right now with about 80% uh, market share, that requires premium 91 octane or higher auto gas. Now, the 81 horsepower 912 UL, that can run on 87 octane regular MoGas. Now, you have to realize when you're flying cross country, when you go to uh, an airport that has MoGas, most often it's going to be 87 octane. So if you have the, the 100 horsepower ULS, you have to remember that you can't use that fuel. You have to use the 100 LL. That is one of the advantages of the 81 horsepower version. It is lower compression and will run on regular 87 octane gas. Now just, just as I mentioned, the two strokes, the 582, 503, 447 engines will all run on 87 octane regular MoGas. The uh, 618 requires premium. The 914 turbo also requires 91 octane or higher auto gas. Now, if you're using auto gas, which again is, uh, uh, does work very well in these engines, they don't need the lead, they actually prefer not to have it. Uh, the only uh, negative, really, is if you store the engine for extended periods of time and you don't use a fuel stabilizer when you're doing that. In that case, uh, the main jet, which is shown right here, that can become fouled. And the idle jet, which is up in this tubular section, can also become fouled. And you want to make sure, well, I if you have a problem starting the engine or if it runs rough when you start it, it's probably one of those two that is going to be suspect. Now, this cork gasket that you see, which seals off the float bowl from the main body of the carburetor, that must be up in this groove section of the carburetor. If it falls off and ends up on the bowl of the carburetor rim, and you try and put the carburetor bowl up onto the body without first seating it into this slot, it's going to probably not seat properly. And part of it will be hanging out inside the carburetor or on the outside, and you'll have a leak. 
So it's really important that you do make sure you push that uh, gasket up into the carburetor body, into this groove, before you try and put the float uh, ball back in place. Now, if you use Avgas, and, and, and many of our customers do, um, that's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's more expensive, and it does, uh, but it does store very, very well. It also has an advantage at high altitudes. It's less prone to vapor lock. Um, and it's a good choice for your last fill-up of the season if you're going to store your airplane because uh, Avgas is very stable and it doesn't deteriorate like Autogas. Uh, a couple of things that you can do if you're going to run Avgas to help the engine out. One is use a product called TCP. Uh, and that helps mitigate the negative effects of the tetraethyl lead. It, uh, it, it helps turn it into a powder and it goes right out through the exhaust. Uh, the other thing you can do is run higher power settings. Uh, some light sport aircraft can operate at very low power settings. And those lower, lower power settings combined with 100 LL, if you don't use the TCP, will eventually cause valve sticking. Now, they're not going to cause the engine to quit. I mean, they're not going to put you down in a field somewhere. But over time, if you use that combination we like you to avoid, low power settings and consistent use of 100 LL, you'll end up sticking valves after about 400 hours. You might see a little bit of a miss now and then, and we'll have to clean the valve. So easy to avoid. Either use, that, either use auto gas or high power settings and or TCP. Now, if you use a blend, auto gas sometimes and av gas other times, that also helps to mitigate the effects of the av gas. <coughs> As you can see up there, we don't recommend the use of TCP with the 914 turbo because the way it takes the lead and turns it into that powder and shoots it out the exhaust, it tends to build up on the turbine blades of the uh, turbine. It can throw the turbocharger turbine out of balance, and uh, that can ruin the turbocharger. So. Uh, although we haven't seen problems with people using it on 914 Rotaxes, uh, TCP, the company that makes it, uh, says it, it, it can be a problem. Now, this is a, a picture of the 912 carburetor, the Bing 64. A couple of features that uh, you should be aware of. Uh, one is that the throttle lever <coughs> is sprung to full throttle. And that means that uh, uh, if you... Uh, are going to start the engine before it's hooked up, uh, you have to be aware of that. You don't want to do that because it's at full throttle. So you need to hook up the throttle linkage and pull it back to idle. Now this engine will start at full power and go right to full power. And if you don't have a prop on it, we've had a number of customers do that. They couldn't wait to get their baby going, had it in the airplane, didn't have the throttle linkage hooked up, and decided they were going to start up the engine without the prop on it and then maybe just rev it up a little by moving the throttle levers. They didn't realize it was already at full throttle and it goes uh, from, uh, from zero RPM to kablooey in about one second. So you don't want to do that. Um, the other thing is be aware that if you mistakenly start the engine at full power on the line, it will rev up to full power immediately. It's quite remarkable. It takes, uh, takes the power right away. And last year we had a, a a customer start a 912 by accident uh, in the display area and they had the throttle lever pushed all the way into the panel to make it easy for customers to get in and out of the airplane and they had someone had turned the mags on and they didn't realize it and somebody was getting in the plane they bumped the starter and the engine started up and it went to full power ripped the tie downs out of the ground and attacked a Toyota pickup truck uh, went like a hundred feet in just a couple seconds luckily nobody got hurt but you know, just be aware that if you start at high power, it's going to go right away. Then the, number, the uh, lead-in bullet up here, the vent line on the 912 carburetor must be vented to the same air pressure that is going into the carburetor uh, that it's breathing. And this, is, uh, this can be a problem because some customers decide to take this vent line, which is pictured right here, and extend it down to the belly of the airplane. Okay, because they feel, well, if, it, if any uh, fuel should come out the vent line, they want it to come down on the belly and not into the engine compartment. It's a good idea, but it's not a good idea because then once you get into flight, uh, the uh, high velocity of air on the belly of the airplane is going to present a different pressure than what is going into the carburetor. You're going to have a poor differential between the float chamber and the venturi, and your, uh, your engine is not going to run properly. So you don't want to do that. The other thing is because 
we said if you have a uh, an, if you if you, if you had an air box, you have to make sure that you then attach that vent line to the air box again, so that the pressure going into the carburetor is the same as is seen in the uh, in the uh, uh, float chamber. Okay, um, the 912 is a dual carburetor setup. The carburetors must be properly synchronized. Uh, this will help the life of the gearbox. It makes the engine run much smoother. So we like to see uh, we like to see the engine operate at uh, uh, at least 1,400 RPM at idle. Uh, I prefer to be up closer to 1,800, and we've got to have those carbs synced every 100 100 hours the 100-hour inspection normally. Both those things are, are very important to make the engine run smooth and to help the life of the gearbox. If you could save your questions to the end, sir, try and hold that question. I'm going to give you time right at the end to, to do that. Uh, this is what the carb synchronizing uh, gauge looks like. And what we do is we, we buy these uh, manifold pressure gauges, vacuum gauges, about 50 to 100 at a time. We set them up in match sets and make up these carb sync kits so that uh, you have two gauges that read identical. And you hook them up to each of the manifolds and, uh, and that gives you your vacuum on each side. You mechanically adjust the throttle linkage at idle until both carburetors are pulling exactly the same amount of vacuum. It's a fairly simple process once you understand how to do it. Um, I did write an article for EAA uh, uh, Sport Pilot Magazine on, on how to do that. And uh, we also have some schools now uh, at Aerotechnical Institute where we teach how to do the carb synchronization process. Again, uh, Sport Pilot Magazine uh, uh, has a lot of good information about these engines and about other uh, light sport maintenance tips, and uh, I, I've probably written a dozen or so articles for them on various aspects of maintaining or setting up the Rotax engines. The uh, carburetors are mounted to the engine via a rubber socket uh, to isolate it from heat and vibration. On the older 912 engines, it's, it's critical that you get the gap on the, uh, on the mounting uh, clamp perfect and they require seven millimeter gap. And if you see where the uh, arrow is right there, that seven millimeter is difficult to achieve if you don't use a measuring device. Here I have a seven millimeter Allen wrench pictured, which is an easy uh, way of determining you have the correct gap. You simply tighten up the clamp until it touches on both sides of the Allen wrench. Now, if you over tighten the older sockets, they will tend to crack along the edge of the clamp and tear. If you tighten them even beyond that, then they tend to shoot the carburetor out like a torpedo. Um, obviously, it's something that you want to avoid. And the reason we make such a big deal out of this is even someone who's fairly mechanically apt will tend to uh, over-tighten that carburetor uh, clamp if they don't realize that it has to be at 7 millimeter. Now, a couple of years ago, Rotax we designed the carburetor socket with a harder rubber and nylon reinforcement internally. And they put a spacer on there so that you couldn't over tighten the clamp. Because the newer sockets are a little bit thicker um, and they're using the same clamp, they now go to eight millimeter. So if you see that little silver uh, spacer, then you know you have the newer style carb socket. Those carb sockets, uh, really are, are a big improvement, and they're made just for this engine. Most people, most of our customers, use the K&N air filters, which are recommended by Rotax. They work very well. They do need to be serviced every 100 hours or once a year, whichever comes first. And they should be cleaned with the K&N air filter cleaner and warm water. You want to avoid, avoid using solvent uh, or compressed air. And by solvent, I mean, mean gasoline, kerosene, parts washer cleaner, any kind of solvent, you will damage the filter element. So you need to go ahead and, and use warm water and, uh, and the, the uh, K&N filter cleaner. Works very well. You want to let that filter dry in the air. 
You don't want to uh, put it in the sun because you'll sh shrink the, uh, the gauze that's in there. When it's completely dry, you re-oil it with the K&N uh, filter oil, which is dyed red so that you can see that you've got it on the entire filter. Now, if you don't re-oil the filter after you've done that, then you're not going to trap the small particles of dirt and dust. And uh, you're just going to catch the leaves and things like that. So you, you want to you make sure you have oil on there. Also, it helps keep rain out if the engine happens to sit out in the rain at all. How many of you guys had a good lunch out here today? A couple? It's really fun coming on right after lunchtime because everybody's had something to eat and now they're ready for a nap. So I'm going to keep my eye on you guys. I want to make sure none of you fall asleep on me. This is a um, uh, metal mesh screen, which we recommend using as a fuel filter. Uh, it's not recommended to use a paper filter. A lot of guys do. But the problem with paper filters is they can be plugged up by uh, fine uh, particulate matter. Also, they can be plugged up by water. So uh, I'll tell you a, a quick story about uh, that I, uh, an experience I had when using a paper filter. The car I had when I was in college uh, had paper filters, as most automobiles do, and they really do a great job of filtering out even the finest particles. The problem is, uh, well, I was headed home from school one year, and all of a sudden my engine started bucking and missing. And I uh, thought, you know, I wonder what's going on. And, and it basically, when I backed off on the throttle, uh, the car smoothed out. So I had to keep reducing my speed gradually. Uh, I took the nearest exit, the first exit that came along, uh, went to a small town, found an auto parts store, and I kind of guessed that I probably had a plugged up fuel filter because when I tried to throttle up, the, the engine would start to miss as if it wasn't getting fuel. Uh, I, I bought a fuel filter and uh, got some tools, found the fuel filter under the hood and put the new one on there, started the engine up, Sure enough, it ran perfectly. So I figured, okay, that's, that, I'm in business. Now, this happened just after I had filled the tank with gas. So I headed on down the road, and about 40 miles down the road, it started doing the same thing over again. Ah. Well, at least this time I knew what the problem was. So again, I pulled off at the next exit, found the nearest auto parts store, and this time I bought a whole bag full of filters. And sure enough, every 40 miles or so, I had to pull over and change the filter until I used up that whole tank of gas. And what had happened was, in the fuel load I had taken on, I had, it had been contaminated with some, some foreign matter that had the consistency of flour, very fine, white, powdery substance. And it was completely plugging up the filter. Now, obviously, this is something that you wouldn't want to have happen in the air. That's why we recommend using a metal mesh type screen. And this same type of screen is what you find in a gas escalator, typically. This screen will allow fine particles, like the ones that plugged up my fuel filter, to pass through them. Those particles won't hurt the uh, carburetor. I mean, they'll go right through the jets, and they'll be burnt. Anything that is large enough to plug up the jets in the carburetor, they'll stop. But they're very difficult to plug completely. Now, a few years ago, Rotax came out with a high-powered starter for the 912S, the high higher performance version of the engine, the 100 horsepower. It's gold in color. The older ones were painted black on the outside. So you can tell if you have one of the high-powered starters by its color. They're a bit longer, and in some applications, they don't fit because they get too close to the firewall. You can shorten it to within a quarter inch of the old black starter by cutting off the two lobes pictured here in my hand that are used for another application and aren't needed on the 912S. We get a lot of questions about oil. What type of oil should I be using in my Rotax? Uh, and really, the best oil to use is a modern four-stroke motorcycle oil. The reason for that is that four-stroke motorcycle oils use modern automotive technology, and this engine is based on modern auto automotive technology, so we want to use an automotive-type oil, not an aviation fuel, do not, or aviation oil. Do not use aviation oil. Uh, but we really would like to have the extra gear additive that motorcycle engine oils have because like motorcycles, we use our engine oil to lubricate our gearbox. And that's why we like that motorcycle type oil. Um, pictured here is the Pen's, Pens oil, four-stroke motorcycle oil, which is one of the ones we've had good results with. It comes in a 20W50 and a 10W40. Above freezing, 
32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius, you can use the 20W50. When you get down below freezing, then you want to switch to a 10W40 weight. Rotex prefers the higher weights because, again, it helps the gearbox. Now, a lot of the reason that automobiles today are using the smaller or the lower weights, the 5W30 oils that you see, is to achieve greater fuel economy. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make your engine last longer. Um, so that's part of the reason we want to use the heavier weights in our engine. Our engines are running under high load at close to full throttle for extended periods of time. Automobile engines have a much different life. They tend to run at very, very low power settings. And if you open up the throttle on your car engine, it's usually only for a very short time. If you were to leave it wide open for long, you'd probably be uh, you know, in an accident or have a ticket. So it's a really a different application. Now, <coughs> there are some very good synthetic oils on the market. Uh, Mobile One is one of them. Uh, and Mobile One will give you extended oil change intervals. We have a picture of uh, Mobile One MX4T. This is the 1040 version. Uh, we prefer the 2050 V-Twin oil now that we found out that it does have the gear additive in it for, again, temperatures above freezing. Now, uh, one of the things that you have to really n understand is Mobile One does not work well with Avgas. Okay? Mobile had an aviation oil many years ago and they ended up pulling it off the market for that reason. For customers that use auto gas uh, more than 70% of the time, uh, they can go ahead and use the, uh, the mobile one. And if you use unleaded auto gas all of the time, you can take advantage of 100 hour or annual oil change intervals. And it works very, very well. However, if you're going to use Avgas, then you need to go to a semi-synthetic or a uh, mineral-based oil like the Pennzoil you saw in the previous slide. And something else that we uh, run into on a regular basis in a lot of the light sport airplanes that have analog tachometers is that the tachometer will um, be uh, inaccurate. Some of the cheaper ones are, are off by a couple hundred, 300 RPM sometimes. Now we do have available an optical strobe. You can buy them at uh, uh, model stores as well. You aim that at the propeller and you can do it from in the cockpit usually. And it'll give you the exact RPM of the propeller. You multiply that by your gearbox ratio, which in the case of the 912S is 2.43 to 1. And that'll give you your exact engine RPM. It's pretty handy if you have, especially if you have an adjustable tachometer, and many of the new ones are. Uh, maximum RPM on the two strokes is 6,800. Maximum on the four strokes all the 9 series is 5,800 RPM. Uh, now on the Rotax engines, they have a special oil filter that's made for them by Champion. That oil filter differs from automotive type filters in that it has a higher bypass pressure on the filter itself. Because we run at higher power settings and we often go to high power settings within a reasonably short time of startup, we don't want the uh, oil to be bypassing the filtration portion of the filter. Now, in order to make sure that that's not happening, you need to have at least 120 degrees Fahrenheit oil temperature before you go to take off power. And that is with the Rotax filter. If you have a different filter, it would have to be a much higher temperature before you could be sure you weren't going to be bypassing the filter element. One uh, uh, thing that can help uh, uh, this situation in, in the winter time, a lot of uh, uh, installations run too low in oil temperature in the winter time, and they either have to block off the uh, oil cooler or they just uh, fly like that. There are several oil thermostats that are now available that help keep the temperature up. Uh, this particular one shown is a 180 degree thermostat. We have another one now that's a 200 degree thermostat. This is a drawing of the 9 series oil circuit and it gives you a good idea of what's going on. It's kind of interesting uh, and helpful. This is the oil uh, tank. So it's a dry sump engine. The oil is kept in this tank. It's drawn out through this tube from the center lower portion of the oil tank to this line through the oil cooler and into the oil pump gear driven off the camshaft. 
It's then in, uh, pushed through the oil filter and then pumped through the engine to lubricate and cool the engine. Now, once it's completed its, its job in the engine, it pools in the bottom of the crankcase where it is returned to the oil canister via crankcase pressure through this line right here. So basically coming back you have burps of air, which is the, the uh, pressure that's created by the little bit of blow-by you get on your rings while the engine's running, and the, uh, uh, and the oil as it, as it returns to the canister. It comes at an angle, swirls around the outer portion of the canister, and, uh, and then any uh, debris, which there shouldn't be any, but if you have a problem, would settle into the bottom of the engine, and there's actually a plate that separates that from the draw portion. Now, one thing you have to remember, we have had customers that have hooked up these lines backwards. You want to be sure when you hook up your oil lines that you get them hooked up correctly. Obviously, if you hook up the suction side to the return line, it has a short piece up here, and you're probably going to just draw air. Okay? And obviously, that's a bad thing. Now, the other thing we see quite often, because it's a dry sump engine, uh, the manufacturer or the installer, if it's a home built, often has a choice of the height that he uh, mounts the oil tank relative to the oil pump. Now, what you want is ideally you want the oil level in the tank to be even with the inlet of the oil pump height wise. If the oil tank is too low, then the oil la lines will, will drain back into the tank and, and, and you'll have a dry oil line every time you start. That's not really a good thing. If the oil tank is mounted too high, then over time, oil will siphon out of the oil tank through the pump and into the case. And so when you go to check your oil, it'll be low, but the oil will actually be in the engine case. If it's mounted at the ideal height, there won't be any movement. Now, the suction side of the engine, as we, sh we showed you the oil pathway as it comes from the oil tank into the oil pump, uh, it's critical that you don't have any tight bends in your oil line. And here, going into the pump, you can see an example of a tight bend. Now, we've already moved, removed the clamp here and put it back on. But you want to make sure that you don't have a tight bend like that. Looking at that cold, it might look okay now, but you can see where the line has started to kink. Now, imagine putting 200 degree oil through that rubber line and then adding a tremendous amount of suction. What happens is the line becomes soft, and then you add the suction and it sucks shut and you, you, you cut off the flow of oil to the engine. So we don't want tight bends like that. That can be avoided uh, by replacing that with a, uh, a uh, metal fitting like the one pictured here. So that, that goes right into the oil pump and makes a 90 degree bend. That's what the parts look like separately. This actually plums into the oil pump itself. And then you have this 90 degree fitting and then you can hose clamp your line on there and make a straight shot back. Now Rotex has changed the dipsticks over the last few years because the modern oils that we're getting today are actually sticking to the engine components much better than the older oils were. And much more of the oil ends up staying in the engine for a longer period of time. This means that the level of oil in the canister tends to run at a lower level. As a result of that, Rotax has raised the minimum and maximum levels of the oil tank, and they've tightened up the range. So you can see this was the old dipstick, and the flat section was an acceptable oil range. The old dipsticks had a rounded top to the handle. The newer dipsticks have a squared off handle, and that's how you can tell you have the newer style. It has a narrower range and it's much higher. You can see now that the minimum allowable range is close to where the maximum used to be. Now, we, we like to see tachometers installed that have the uh, color arcs. Uh, they help the pilot to see exactly what's going on with the engine RPM and whether he's in the right place where he should be. Uh, you can see on this one we have a red arc down below 1400 RPM. We don't want you to run below 1400 RPM once the engine started. We have a yellow area from 1400 to 1800, which is an area that the engine can run in, but it's, it's, it's not real happy there. Um, you're actually putting some wear load on the gearbox. Once you get up above 1800, 
the gearbox smooths out and it's very, very happy from there all the way up to 5,500 RPM where you can run continuously even at wide open throttle position as long as you don't exceed any of the maximum temperatures. And you have a uh, five minute allowable time from 5,500 to the 5,800 red line. And that is takeoff power. Now, you also want to monitor your oil pressure and oil temperature. Oil pressure should remain between 29 and 73 PSI. And we have red lines set at 12 and 100 PSI. Now, on a cold day during startup, it's possible to see the oil pressure go up, usually up to about 70, 70 PSI or so. It can go as high as 100 without any damage. Um, that would be unusual, only in very cold temperatures. Now, a lot of people ask me, okay, I see what the ranges are that are allowed, but what is normal? Normal is really going to be about uh, 45 to 55 PSI. That is pretty much what we normally see. And if you're outside of that range, 45 to 60, say, then there's probably something going on, an, an indication error or something wrong with the oil system. So I wouldn't wait until it gets down to the minimum uh, where you could actually have damage to do something about it. If you're running below 45 PSI, you need to look into it and see what's going on. Now, the oil temperature uh, should be redlined at 266 degrees. And we did also mention that critical temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which you need before you go to take off power. A cylinder head temperature is another uh, indication that we like to, to uh, monitor. The cylinder head temperature is going to depend on the model that you have and the type of coolant that you're using, the maximum. Um, the, if you're using Evans waterless coolant, which has a 300, about a 350 degree boiling point, then you can utilize the uh, 275 degree maximum cylinder head temperature on the 912S and the 914 turbo. If you're using the uh, 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 912 UL 81 horsepower version, then it has a 300 degree maximum cylinder head temperature. Now the 275 degree red line is based on the temperature where if you exceed that temperature, you could have detonation in the turbo and the 100 horsepower 912. But if you're not using the Evans, if you're using a, water, uh, a regular water mixed coolant, um, then we worry about you boiling the coolant. So instead of worrying about detonation, we're worried about boiling the coolant, and then we have to drop it back to about uh, 248. So again, with the Evans, you can go to 300 on the 81. You can go to 370, 275 on the, on the 100 horse 912S and the turbo. If you are using Evans, uh, you need to mark your radiator cap so that everybody knows that it's got Evans in it. You cannot add any water with the Evans. Only can be topped with Evans waterless coolant. Here again, we're showing that if you're using the 50-50 mix of distilled water and conventional coolant, we recommend DexCool at the moment. Um, that you do want to recognize those two, two, 239 or 248 degree uh, uh, red lines. And those are based on the type of pressure cap you have. If it's the old 0.9 bar cap, you're stuck at 239. If it's a, uh, a 1.2 bar cap, which is approximately 17 and a half PSI, then uh, you can go to 248. Now there is a service bulletin, this SB912043R1, which explains all this. Uh, and if you really want to get into it a little deeper, you can call our shop and talk to one of our techs or visit our booth at the show here. We're actually in uh, Building D, as in Delta, uh, across from Garmin. And we have one of our best techs there, uh, Kerry, uh, and uh, he can explain some of these uh, things to you. And I'll be there uh, most of the time also. We get a lot of questions about coolant and coolant temperatures. Now. I left this slide in here because there is a way uh, some of the OEMs can do some specialized testing and actually put their own red line on the gauge, which may be somewhat different from the, the ones that I've shown you. Of course, it, it wouldn't be over the maximums, uh, but it could be somewhere between the 248 and the 275 uh, based on the way their cooling system performs with conventional coolant. One of the things we've seen with a lot of the European light sports coming over here is they use European coolant. And European coolant 
is often mixed at a different ratio than the U.S. coolants. All the U.S. coolants that I know of mix at a 50-50 ratio, typically. Okay, and, and again, as we mentioned just a moment ago, you want to use that distilled water with your coolant. But if you have European antifreeze, which if you got a European uh, built light sport, it's probably going to have that in it. Uh, you, they mix at a different ratio, so you want to be careful how you top. Um, I recommend that you go 200 hours, like Rotax says, dump it out and put Dex Cool in 50-50, uh, or the uh, Evans, depending on what they recommend, what the manufacturer of your aircraft recommends, and then you know what you've got from that point on. But be careful if you see something like this on your firewall, 80% antifreeze, 20% water, that's not going to work unless you have their coolant, which is hard to get here. This is a, a magneto housing, which also has the water pump in it, and you can see where the water pump housing is all corroded and pitted right in this area, and that is because this particular customer was using tap water in his engine instead of distilled water with the antifreeze. And the tap water often contains uh, things, uh, minerals, and uh, things like chlorine, which uh, are corrosive, especially to aluminum. Um, the TBO has been raised on these engines recently. Uh, the, uh, the 912 UL, uh, 15 years or 1,500 hours. The 912 ULS, 12 years or 1,500 hours. The 914 Turbo is at 12 years or 1,200 hours. And of course, all the two strokes are still at uh, five years or 300 hours. Uh, the engines are making these times very, very easily. Uh, they are realistic, if anything, conservative. Um, and they've been bumping them up a couple hundred hours at a time every few years as they get, gain more experience. Um, one thing I would, would mention here on this 912S, uh, 12 years or 1,500 hours, that is, uh, it, it can do that at, at 5,500 RPM. I mean, it'll, it'll run 5,500 RPM max continuous for 1,500 hours. We've seen that a number of times. Um, if you're setting up your idle properly and running uh, uh, the uh, carbs synchronized, you will have to do some gearbox maintenance and you will have to do some carburetor maintenance as is outlined in the maintenance manual during that time. Uh, but the main components of the engine will, will easily do that time. We do strongly recommend that you maintain good logbooks and keep track of your hours. Some of the light sports we're seeing have the hour meters tied into the master switch. We think this is uh, a bad idea uh, because it's easy to leave the master switch on and you often will have the master switch on while you're working on your avionics and so, so you're actually tagging time onto the engine that isn't really taking place. Uh, we like to see the uh, hour meter come on when the engine is running only. And this can be uh, accomplished in a number of ways. One of them is by putting an oil pressure switch into the engine uh, so that the hour meter comes on when the engine gets oil pressure. Uh, there's another uh, UMA TAC, which I, I showed you earlier. We had a picture of it up on the screen. That tachometer has a fourth wire coming out of it. And that wire can be used to feed the hour meter with power so that when the tachometer sees more than 500 RPM, the hour meter runs. It's a pretty slick setup. Um, the engine does have a cylinder temperature maximum that most people aren't aware of. It only needs to be checked during initial testing on a, uh, on a, on a new installation. So if any of you are building a home built and you're doing your own installation, you do need to check the cylinder head temperature initially on the number two cylinder uh, until you're sure that it's staying below 375 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you know that is uh, not being exceeded on the worst case scenario, a hot day, extended climb, then you can stop monitoring it. Engines that have a tough time keeping their cylinders cool need to install a, uh, a cowling like the one pictured here, uh, which actually directs air down over the cylinders themselves. Uh, in, the, in the lower part of the picture, you can see a finger here pointing to this oil pressure switch, which has been installed into the oil pump in a, uh, a, 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 a fitting which is normally not used. It's only there for the 914 turbo where it feeds the turbocharger with oil. So on the 914 you can't use this setup, but on the 912 and 912S you can. Again, logbooks are very important. We want to make sure that you guys all 
keep a good track of your, your engine time um, and your uh, airframe time. You should have separate books for your engine and your airframe so that if you ever sell your engine or trade to a different engine, the old engine logbook will go with the engine and you'll get a new one with your new engine. There is a new service bulletin out on the fuel pumps for the four strokes. Uh, you might want to go online and take a look at it. There again, if you have any questions about it, you're welcome to come over to our booth in Building D uh, after the presentation where we have uh, Carrie and myself available to answer your questions. Um, you can always go to the Rotax website at rotax-aircraft-engines.com and download any of the uh, service bulletins for free. You can also download all of the Rotax manuals as PDF files for free anytime. And you can log in as a guest. Uh, well, you can log on to that website anytime without, without uh, it's, it's easy to get on it and uh, get whatever you need. Now, we do have, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've taken a lot of the technical expertise that we've gained over the last few years, and we've started a new school called Aerotechnical Institute. You can go to our website at aerotechnicalinstitute.com. We run schools at our Sebring facility on a year-round basis. Um, we have several schools coming up, um, May 10th and 11th, uh, two-day four-stroke schools listed there. You see in June and July, we also have schools. And we also have some new airframe schools coming up. Uh, we've started one on the uh, Technum, we've got the next one coming up in June, and on the CT airframe. And that also includes engine training, line maintenance training on the engine. We're going to be including other airframes one by one as time allows. Uh, Dean is uh, available for questions down in the uh, light plane area. He's in space number, space number 20 in the, in the light plane area. And we do have some slots available for a school on Tuesday, on uh, wait a minute, uh, Sunday and Monday coming up. Now, uh, if we have any questions, uh, if you would just uh, raise your hand and uh, one of our FAA guys will come up and, uh, and uh, give you a mic so that everyone can hear your question. Yeah, all of the uh, automotive gas in my area is 10% ethanol. How does that uh, work with Rotax? That's a great question. I uh, get a lot of that, that uh, type of question. Rotax has told us that up to 5% alcohol is not a problem. And they have tested that and they say not to worry about it. Now, when you get to 10%, there's no official word yet from the factory. Uh, however, we have a number of customers that have been operating on up to 10% which is becoming more and more prevalent, and we haven't seen any problems. Uh, our biggest concern, the engine doesn't seem to really care. Uh, it's the fuel system, the fuel tanks, the fuel lines that we really worry about, especially composite fuel tanks. Alcohol will, will tend to attack certain composite fuel tanks. So you know, that's, that's our biggest worry. Number two concern is vapor lock. If you have a tractor airplane where you have a tightly enclosed cowling, a lot of heat can build up in there. And uh, if, you're, if your fuel lines aren't fire sleeved and if they don't have a bleed back for air, which, which can be set up on a Rotax, you can have a small orifice uh, after the fuel pump just before the carburetors that allows excess fuel pressure to bleed back to the fuel tanks. And at the same time, any air that is accumulates can be bled back <coughs> then uh, you, know, you, you need to be more concerned about how much alcohol you have. I think you know, the best thing is everybody keeps talking to one another. We keep looking for problems and, and uh, trying to find out if anybody's having trouble. As of right now, I get a lot of questions. I see a lot of concern, but I don't, uh, I don't see any real problems. Uh, I certainly would not use anything more than 10%, though. Okay, any other questions? Sir, so right here. I was just wondering if you have the uh, vacuum gauges in your booth here and how much they are for uh, uh, doing the carb Yeah, we do have the uh, this carb synchronizing kit, uh, and I believe that runs about $79 for that kit. And uh, yeah, we did, we did bring some to the show. Um, when you, when, if you have a question, uh, when, uh, when the representative comes up to you, let him hang on to the mic. We just want to make sure that you're not going to, you know, grab that mic and, <laughs> and go crazy. So, uh, next question. 
Uh, yes, I've heard the problem where uh, certain planes, that 1800 RPM, the airplane has a tendency to float down the runway and, mm -hmm. and you use the brakes. Can you get feedback on that? Sure, sure. Um, you do have a 2.43 to 1 reduction ratio. So, you know, even at 1800, your actual prop RPM is still quite low. But uh, some of the airplanes, particularly with uh, the large three blade props, develop quite a bit of static thrust. And if they're very efficient, 1800 RPM will still make the airplane want to want to taxi along a little bit. Um, you know, the, the, the ideal RPM for your combination of propeller and engine is going to depend on the mass inertia of the propeller. Some of the very lightweight two blade props like the new form that uh, some of the CTs have, that really idles very smooth at 1400 RPM. Okay. As you get into some of the, the heavier two blades or the lighter three blades, you start working your way up 15, 1600 RPM. And you can hear the gearbox start to rattle as the torsional vibration damper starts to really work hard. And uh, like on a new form on a CT, for example, right around 1550, 1600, I can hear it smooth out and stop working. You know, that's okay. You can let it do that if you want, but your gearbox will wear more and you'll end up having to replace parts sooner if you do a lot of idling too low. What I recommend is if you have an airplane and a propeller combination, and to finish answering the question there, almost all the propellers, even the heaviest of the three blades that are allowable on that engine, are smooth at 1800 RPM. So, you know, you can often set up with a compromise RPM of around 1600 and some airplanes will set up down closer to 1500, 1400 if they have to, and we tell the customer, you know, jack it up whenever you're standing still or taxing and you can stand it. No, when you're standing still, the brakes aren't wearing. Okay, so you can bring it up and smooth it out a little bit. Surely when you first start the engine, no matter what you have, you want to bring it up to 2000 RPM or so for the first minute until it smooths out. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, in relation to what you showed up there is the warranty period and the amount of hours. That's for a certified engine on a certified plane, right? Well, that's not the warranty period. That's the TVO. The warranty period has actually just been raised uh, to 18 months, a year and a half, or 100 hours, whichever comes first, on the uh, on certified engines. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's on new engines now. It used to be six months, and Rotax was fairly liberal about their what they call uh, goodwill warranty. Um, they've always been pretty good about covering things that look like perhaps there was a factory problem or could have been. Uh, but now they've decided to go ahead and say, okay, let's just make it a year and a half, 100 hours for everybody. Um, do we have any other questions over here? Yeah, you mentioned that there's cab service that has to be done and gearbox service. The, is a cab service, I think, a cleaning and disassembly and reassembly at 200 hours? Yes, sir. They recommend it at 200 hours. And uh, a lot of that is, is because, and it's fairly conservative, but a lot of that is because a lot, most of our customers are using auto gas. And we see, we see engine sitting and we see fouling of the jets. Uh, so it really helps to smooth it out if you keep everything clean. It's a fairly simple, quick process. Um, so, they do recommend having the carbs checked and cleaned every uh, 200 hours. They recommend the gearbox. Now, on the, on the engines that have slipper clutches in them, the newer 912S's, uh, I, I like to see those serviced every 500 hours. And it's a fairly uh, quick service. It's not a big deal. Um, we, you can pull the gearbox off and ship it to us and we turn them around in one day. And ba basically all we're doing is pulling it apart and replacing the spring washers, which soften over time, inspect the splines on the shaft and tighten everything up, re-shim it, put it back, and it runs like a brand new gearbox. And that really affects your starting, makes the engine start a lot easier when the gearbox is tight. The problem is if you don't do that service, if you just let the engine run on and run on, eventually it will become hard to start. It's not going to cause an in-flight failure or anything. It's just it'll get harder and harder to start. If you can start it, you can fly it. It'll run till you shut it off. But if you, if you go beyond the point where you should, you'll tear up the splines on the prop shaft. You'll have to buy a new prop shaft when it finally comes time. Versus if you do the 500-hour service intervals, you'll, uh, that, that shaft will go to TVO. Now, the other thing is if you have a, a 912S 
with uh, zero free play and the old uh, low power starter, kind of need to do it every 300 hours. That's about a $120 service. It's not a real big deal. And like I say, it, it takes us, if you bring it into our shop, we can do the whole service and turn it around in maybe two hours. So it's not, not a big deal. Um, did you have a question over there in the blue shirt, sir? Any, any other questions? Any other questions today? Got one here? I was just wondering when the warranty starts on a 912S. Like I have one that's a year old, it's brand new, sitting on the plane. The plane hopefully will fly in a couple months. But does it start when you first start the engine or when you purchase the engine at 18 months? Well, it officially the starts when you get it because um, okay. there's calendar time. But as I said, Rotax has been pretty good about what they call goodwill warranty. Um, so y you make note of when you get your airworthiness certificate, and that kind of tells us when you probably started running the engine. And, uh, you know, they, they run them all at the factory. Um, they run them through a complete set of, of tests, uh, checking the oil pressure, the temperatures. They put them on a dyno and check the power output. So now they know the engine's working well when they ship it to you. So the chances of you finding something that's not related to your installation, a loose oil hookup or something, is, is, is unlikely but they've been very good about covering things if you do find something. Get with us right away. Question back there. I was specifically interested in the two cycle engines. Uh, do they run the break-in time or do we, should we go through a break-in procedure with the engine? Yes, sir. The break-in is, is very important on the two strokes. In all the manuals, they give you a stepped break-in and uh, um, it's about an hour procedure and it's important that you do go through that procedure to make sure the rings seat properly. Uh, the one thing you do want to be careful of on the two strokes when you're doing that braking is that you don't overheat the engine operating on the ground. If you see that any of the temperatures exceeded or beginning to, to approach maximum, you need to shut the engine down, bring it down, let it cool, and then uh, wait until it's cooled down and then presume, resume the, the, uh, the procedure right where you left off. Uh, if it's an air-cooled engine, uh, when you start it up, you need 200 degree cylinder head temp before you go to high power. Uh, if it's a water-cooled engine, I usually give it a couple of minutes again to get some t temperature in the system before I go to high power, but then you'll resume your break-in right where you left off. Any other questions? Right here again. Um, I was just wondering, to get the accurate oil check, is, I remember I had an 80 horse at one time, 912. Is that a certain amount of time after you shut down to, to where you know you're getting an accurate oil check? Or that's it depends a, on where a, that level is. That's a good is question and it's a good point. Uh, I did mention earlier that uh, we're finding the oil stays in the engine a lot longer. It sticks to the parts a lot better than it used to, which is a good thing. And they've gone ahead and raised the minimum and maximum oil levels in the oil canister. But in order to check your oil properly, you have to you shut the engine off, let it set for about 15, 20 minutes so that the oil will all drain back down into the bottom of the case. Then pull the engine through with the propeller with the mags off until you hear a burp sound in the oil canister. And that means that now all the oil has been pushed back into the canister. You can pull the dipstick and actually check the oil level and get a realistic uh, level uh, check. It's exactly what you have. If you want to be really careful and you should do that before you add oil okay I mean anytime you go flying if you pull the dipstick and it's in the flat you're good to go you don't really need to know exactly how much is in there you can go fly but if you're if it's below the the minimum level and you're gonna add oil then I would go ahead and uh, do that procedure before you add any more um, we have a, a one-hour video which um, the FAA guys have been playing here uh, from time to time in between seminars um, and, and, and that really goes over a lot of this stuff. It runs just over an hour, and so if you guys are interested in that, we do have those in the booth. It, uh, it, it goes over a lot of this critical information. Any other questions? On the Evans uh, coolant, where you have your container normally 50-50 ratio as a glycol, right? Is, is the uh, looking at that container and that bottle, is that necessary on the Evans uh, to have it half full or whatever it's supposed to be on Evans on your little bottle? Okay, yeah, you do want to have a recovery bottle and, and you will get some expansion and contraction, not quite as much as with conventional coolant, but you'll still get some. So, yeah, you still want to have 
usually about a third full on your reservoir, your, your overflow reservoir. Okay, well, I, I appreciate to all of you guys coming out here today, and I hope we gave you some good inf information that will help you. Again, we're in Building D, and uh, we're happy to answer any other questions that you may not have had answered here. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks for coming out today. Thank you so much, Phil. You're welcome. You really uh, handled the difficulty we had there. Great, I appreciate it. No problem. Thank Let you. me go get the mic off and I'll be right back out. <laughs>